Someone had a great quote about working with Robert Altman. He says, it was like being taken to the, the edge of a cliff. Bob pushes you over the cliff. You don't know what you're doing, but you're really interesting screaming on the way back. <laughs> The Popeye movie is not that bad. What am I? Some kind of barnacle on the thing of your life? Actually, I might go one step further with this one and say it shouldn't be classified as bad at all. I think we owe him an apology. Oh, your intentions are good, yes. In an era when movie adaptations of comic strip characters have become so genericized and flat, Popeye deserves a second look for just how truly impressive it is from a filmmaking standpoint. <laughs> Now, it's not a perfect movie, far from it. Uh, never good to be too full, I guess. But there are far more good elements in it than bad ones. In particular, the perfect casting of nearly every single character. <laughs> but also an inventive fight choreography that homages the cartoon, terrific costumes and makeup design, and a stunningly immersive set that still stands over 40 years later. <laughs> But beyond that, this is just a fun movie that deserves to be remembered more fondly today for just how much craftsmanship and hard work went into it. Pui! And double pui! But much like other movies I've covered in this series, the behind-the-scenes production makes for a more interesting tale than the events of the plot. So let's set sail for Sweet Haven to take a look back at Popeye. Well, I'm on my way. Old Reservoir. Today's video is sponsored by Factor. Much like Popeye needs his spinach, I need high quality, fresh, never frozen meals, and that's why I use Factor. Working non traditional work hours, it's sometimes hard for me to allocate time for cooking and cleanup, which in the past always led me to turn to unhealthy takeout options. But then I discovered Factor, and they've revolutionized my diet. Each week, I'm able to choose from over 34 flavor packed meals, from seasonal chef's choice to protein plus to dietitian approved calorie smart meals. Factor also offers Gourmet Plus meals as part of your weekly options, which means you can get a little gourmet with your meal plan whenever you're craving something special. Then in a few days, my box shows up on my doorstep, packed with all my great meal choices. When it's dinner time, I simply choose my meal, heat for two minutes, and then I enjoy my fresh flavor-packed dinner with no cleanup. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code HATSOFF50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. To discuss how Popeye the movie came about, we should first talk about how the character came about in general. The character of Popeye, created by cartoonist E.C. Cigar, first appeared in January 1929 as a supporting character in the Thimble Theater comic strip, which was syndicated nationwide by Kang Features. The strip originally centered around Harold Hangravy, who actually appears in the movie, played by Bill Irwin, and his girlfriend Olive Oil. Other characters included Olive's brother Castor and parents Nana and Cole. We're all one big happy family here, although not really. Originally created as a supporting character, Popeye became so popular with kid readers that by the following year, Olive Oil had dumped ham gravy and was now with Popeye. Oh, Seeger even used the popularity of the character amongst kids to promote healthy eating, giving Popeye superhuman strength that could only be brought about by him eating spinach. Spinach and bread. The comic strip continued to evolve throughout the 1930s, with new characters added throughout the decade, including Wimpy, Sweet Pea, Poop Deck Pappy, and of course, Bluto. The villain from Popeye? What, it's because of the beard? That's because he's... What's that? Seeing the growing popularity of the character, Fleischer Studios signed a deal with King Features to bring the characters to the big screen in a series of theatrical shorts to be released by Paramount. It was through Fleischer's cartoons that the Popeye we know today came to be. He now had a voice, first by William Costello. Oh yeah! Wham. And later by Jack Mercer, who voiced the character until his death in 1984. Oh, is that so? Well, I ask a voice. Besides that, who's coming in? You're a crowd. Even cameoing in the film's opening. Hey, what's this? One of Bluto's tricks? I'm in the wrong movie! Fleischer also expanded upon Popeye's need for spinach, elevating it from a character trait to a full-blown trademark.
The shorts were also incredibly popular, leading to more success for the character. As the industry evolved though, so did Popeye, who made the leap from theatrical shorts to TV syndication in 1960, and later in a Saturday morning cartoon from Hanna-Barbera starting in 1978. But twice a day and use dental floss helps him fight tooth decay and keep your teeth strong and clean. So how did Popeye go from a Hanna-Barbera show to a feature film in just two years? Well, you can thank Annie for that. Based on the Little Orphan Annie comic strip, Annie the Musical opened on Broadway in 1977 and was a huge hit. As such, Hollywood Studios started scrambling to secure the motion picture rights. One of the most eager to get his hands on those rights was producer Robert Evans at Paramount. You want to be a great producer? You do whatever it takes to get your movie made the way you want to do it. Now you want New York? Go there. Make some deals, prove that you could do it for the money, beg, borrow, I don't give a fuck! Paramount lost out on the rights during a bidding war to Columbia, though. Dejected, Evans called an emergency meeting to find out how Paramount could rush their own project into development to compete with Annie. When inquiring what comic strips they could adapt, Evans discovered that the studio still owned the theatrical rights to Popeye, as they had since the original shorts in the 1930s. This excited Evans, and he immediately set out to bring Popeye to the big screen. <laughs> Ooh, don't make them like they used to. When seeking a screenwriter, a fellow Paramount executive recommended carnal knowledge author Jules Pfeiffer to Evans. Pfeiffer, who got his start in the industry as a cartoonist, idolized the work of Popeye creator E.C. Cigar. Dick said to Evans, the only one who could write this script is, is me, Jules Pfeiffer, he said. So um, Evans called me up on the phone and he said, would you like to do this Popeye? And I said depending on whichever, which Popeye do you want, because the ones created, the one Popeye, the original comic strip in the newspaper, uh, I adored and I thought was a piece of absolutely brilliant work and I said I would want to adapt that. But the animated cartoons I thought was su sucked. Evans agreed and set out casting the ambitious project. He envisioned Dustin Hoffman and Gilda Radner as Popeye and Olive Oil respectively. Hoffman actually signed on in late 1977, and even went as far as to take vocal lessons to master Popeye's iconic voice. Then, when the star met with screenwriter Pfeiffer, the two did not see eye to eye. Hoffman refused to be in the film if Pfeiffer remained, and in a surprise move, Evans actually backed Pfeiffer, and Hoffman walked from the project the following year. I have no doubt he, that, 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 he, that he could have done it, but what's, what's extraordinary about Evans is that uh, he gave up his star for, for, to, to keep the writer. Nobody does that. Fortunately for Evans, though, Paramount, through their TV division at CBS, had recently gone into business with a real-life cartoon character, the then 27-year-old Robin Williams. Though the actor piqued Evans' interest, it wasn't until the first season of Morgan Mini premiered in 1978 that he realized just how perfectly suited Williams was for the part. The show also made Robin Williams a household name, so Evans was eager to sign him. Robin excitedly signed on in 1979, with Popeye becoming his first ever film role. Do you, uh, do you have any preconceived notion uh, of how you're going to do Popeye? Uh, can you talk about that at all? No, I'm just starting to train for it now, do a lot of acrobatics and work on some man's helping with the voice. I'm just, he's just, it's a lot of, yeah. mm, that's me. Is that the voice? Not yet. Ah. <laughs> with a lead actor in place, Evans started vetting potential directors. Though Hal Ashby was his first choice, the script found its way into the hands of another director in desperate need of a comeback, Robert Altman. I feel that the, the medium of film has mm. not yet really been explored. In other words, I think that when we started uh, a film, we took it from theater, literature, and we were an extension of, of another art form. Though the early 70s had been a great success for the director with films like M.A.S.H., McCabe and Mrs. Miller, The Long Goodbye, and Nashville, a string of failures later in the decade had reduced his star power. He, after making Nashville and all those films, you had those few that didn't make a lot of money for Fox, and then you made Popeye. Yeah which in their judgment was a disaster. Well, that was in the public judgment at the time. Popeye was a, is a was very, it made very some money, didn't oh, it? Oh, sure, and it's a very successful film. It's probably one of the most successful videos right now, and it will be because it's a great babysitter. 
Altman, who is known for his reliance on large ensemble casts, seemed to be the perfect fit needed to bring the many cartoon characters of Popeye's world to life. And Altman had been a fighter pilot in Europe and the Pacific, and you just meet these guys and they have such a, you know, they have just a great sense of self-dignity. And that was a wonderful thing just to be around and learn from that, and learn from their love of what they do. Altman nixed the idea of Gilda Radner's casting, instead pulling from his own repertoire of actors and casting Shelley Duvall. The studio didn't want me to play the part. They wanted someone else, someone more um, popular, I guess, or more of a comedian. It seems unthinkable today to see anyone else but Shelley in that part, but Paramount was reluctant to hire her until she did a screen test with Robin Williams. What kind of name is that anyway, Popeye? Pretty strange. What kind of name is olive oil? Sounds like some kind of lubricants. Another Altman regular, Paul Dooley, was soon cast as Wimpy. What is that glop you're eating? It's a soup burger. These are difficult times. Burgers can't be choosers. Boy. While newcomers to his ensemble, such as Ray Walston as Poop Deck Pappy, Your casket shatters on Poop Deck Pappy, pride of the Pacific, and father to the shark, brother to the Piranica, cousin to the killer whale, and Paul Smith as Bluto were also cast. <laughs> Other terrific character actors appear as Sweet Haven residents, such as Linda Hunt. Don't you dare! Hey, you mother thing. So what? You bet I'm the to meet you, Richard Libertini. Uh, 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 uh. Be it. Uh, this is a nickel. A pay is what it feels like paying. Uh, uh. And Donald Moffat as the tax man. First of all, there's 17 cents new in town tax. Then there's 45 cents rowboat under the wharf tax, and one dollar leaving your junk lying around the wharf tax. Robert Altman's infant grandson also joined the cast as Sweet Pea. <laughs> None of that baby oh. talk around me, son. Me son's going to be a man in pink, not a baby in pink, isn't that right? Next would come the music. To oversee the film's eclectic soundtrack, Altman sought Harry Nelson, though he was warned from doing so due to his fondness for drinking. It was also Altman and Robert Evans, which was... That's a combination. Whoa. And throw in Harry Nelson and you got yourself a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Even Betty Ford's going, I'm booked. <laughs> Altman found him to be a consummate professional, though, and Harry was thrilled at the prospect of working on the project, composing 17 songs for the film, though only 11 made it to the final cut. Blow me and if I'm being honest, that's still about three songs too many. You know what I say. He says he's mean. You know what I mean. Towards the end of the movie especially, musical numbers just happen out of nowhere and minutes apart, and they really drag down the action in that final act. With the cast and crew in place, next would be securing a filming location. Altman hated working on Hollywood backlots and refused to shoot the film anywhere but on location. He eventually settled on the Mediterranean island of Malta, located south of Sicily, to double as the fishing village in the story. And so, in late 1979, close to 200 workers began assembling the Sweet Haven set, a process that would span the next 20 months under the careful watch of production designer Wolf Kroger. Really spectacular, spared no expense. Unless you've seen the movie, it can be difficult to understand just how impressive this set is. Again, because Altman refused to shoot in sound stages, the town had to consist of functional houses, businesses, restaurants, and even a mill, all which could be used for both exterior and interior filming. This ain't bad, is it? They ain't the Ritz, but at least you get a little womb service here, huh? <laughs> not to mention a real harbor, which even included sunken pirate ships. The town of Sweet Haven is truly one of the most amazing film sets ever built, so much so that it still stands today as a major tourist attraction called Popeye Village, though it gets annual upgrades and repainting to make it more bright. The set would also house crew facilities, production offices, and a recording studio for Nielsen. To assist with the rapidly growing budget, Paramount lured Disney into co-distributing the film through their Buena Vista Pictures label, and cameras finally rolled in the film in late January 1980. But almost immediately, the production lapsed into turmoil. For starters, Altman wanted the film's lengthy musical numbers to be filmed live, which became a continuity and technical nightmare. I would gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. He would Screenwriter Pfeiffer also clashed with Nielsen over what he felt were uncharacteristic lyrics for the characters, prompting Nielsen to leave Malta during production. I would tell him what I thought the song should be, he would write the thing, and Altman would do everything to, he could to undermine it. As Altman wanted the cast and crew to have a community feel, he required them to live on location, causing them to feel trapped, 
especially once the film began to fall behind schedule. Perhaps no one faced more hardships on set than Robin Williams, though. Another thing I got is a sense of humiliation. Used to the standardized production of a sitcom, Williams found himself struggling to keep up with the manic and disjointed pace of an Altman film. To make matters worse, Robin had to spend countless hours per day forcing one eye closed. Like an agent once called me after seeing the dailies on Popeye and said, could you open your other eye? I went, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you can open the, he doesn't have another eye. Yeah. And wearing large prosthetic forearms that limited his movement and cut off his circulation. He would also have to recite the majority of his dialogue out the side of his mouth through a corncob pipe. One thing I remember about me, Pap, was he, he always used to throw me up in the air. <laughs> but he'd never be there when I come down, you know. The inaudibility of that audio required him to redub most of his performance in post-production. Oh, well, don't look as good as a smell, but too late now. Oh. It really makes you appreciate his talent, seeing how he was able to bring so much energy to a film performance despite everything going on behind the scenes. Oh yeah, I don't know when I've had this much fun and still been conscious. Shelly is equally perfect as olive oil. Oh. 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 And the two of them find a great chemistry that feels like it came right from the comic strips. Well, sweet is about the worst name I ever heard on a baby. Well, what do you want me to call him? Baby oil? Now, Popeye is largely an ensemble movie, and as such, the supporting characters are also played really great. I'm buying. Gee, thanks. Who's paying? I'm buying, he's paying. The nickel hamburger tax. I'd refuse to pay if I were you. A shocking abuse of power. Altman had a knack for directing big scenes with lots of characters moving in and out, and there's quite a few of them in Popeye. Ah! 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 Oh, these innocents. This is a smuggest bug of violence. While every element surrounding the movie is really impressive, the plot is where it falters. The movie revolves around Popeye traveling to Sweet Haven to seek out his long-lost father, Poop Deck Pappy, whom he hasn't seen in 30 years. Upon his arrival, he clashes with the town's residents who aren't used to strangers. There's a stranger in... Um... He eventually finds company in the oil family, though, particularly daughter Olive. <laughs> who's engaged to the feared Captain Bluto. Oh, I hate this table, it's ugly. And I'm the only one with nerve enough to tell the truth about it. Well, then why don't you let Bluto the pushover buy you a new table? Sweet Haven is under Bluto's control while its unseen Commodore is away. It's nine o'clock! Curfew! Lights out! On the night of her engagement party, Popeye inadvertently helps Olive Oil run away, and the two of them find an abandoned baby left to Popeye's care later naming him Sweet Pea. I found him in Sweet Haven, that is why he's me Sweet Pea. I am calling him Sweet Pea and that is his name. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Bluto discovers the two of them together, and he then destroys the oil's house. Literally. This is where we get Popeye and Bluto's first fight, filmed in a really interesting way, where we get a lot of cartoon effects brought to life. <laughs> With the oils now in ruin, Castor decides to challenge Sweet Haven's champion boxer, Oxblood Oxheart. Of course, he loses when he is kicked away like a football. And Popeye steps in to face him, finally winning the town's admiration upon his defeat. It's also never made clear how Popeye can easily defeat Oxblood and a gang of thugs, but not Bluto. A lot of these plot problems can be traced back to Pfeiffer's script, as he wanted to give every single character from the comic strips a part in the film. Come on, haul ass, haul ass! Get this back! They're on the bio body! Get this on, get this on! Come on, come on! At some point, the movie goes completely off the rails when Wimpy discovers Sweepy has a psychic power that allows him to choose the winning horse at a gambling hall. You win 120 simoleons? You know how many hamburgers that is? Disgraceful. After discovering this himself, Bluto kidnaps Sweet Pea and then Olive Oil, while Popeye discovers that his long-lost Pappy is actually the Commodore of Sweet Haven. We, we get the same squinky eye. What squinky eye? The two must reunite and stop Bluto in order to save Olive Oil and Sweet Pea. I guess they're also trying to beat him to this sunken treasure, which is a plot element that comes out of nowhere. 
The movie ramps up to what should be a thrilling climax, an epic battle between Popeye and Bluto. We're even introduced to the giant octopus of the comics, while Popeye finally gets to eat his spinach. But it's a climax cut really short, as Popeye defeats Bluto with a single punch, resulting in a really lackluster finale. In the comics and cartoons, Popeye was usually beaten by Bluto first, but then, upon eating spinach, he would unleash a fury upon him in over-the-top comic set pieces, saving the day in the process. We spend the whole movie waiting for Popeye to give Bluto that comeuppance, for it all to be over with a single punch. Even the giant octopus doesn't really get to shine, as the prop refused to work behind the scenes. Well, somebody misplaced the octopus motor. So when you get in there and fight with him, shake his legs around, it looks like he's killing you. It's such a shame, as you can tell they were literally running out of steam at the end of the movie, and resources were limited. Still, there are some good moments, like finally getting to hear the Popeye theme song. He's Popeye the Sailor Man. He's Popeye the Sailor Man. The movie was quickly edited, with a lot of musical numbers being cut, and managed to be released well before Annie. Despite all of its problems, the film actually turned a neat profit for Paramount. Superman was the problem. That was the hair on the butter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When Popeye was finished, it wasn't a hard action picture like Superman, and it didn't do the Superman grosses, and they were Disney and uh, Paramount were very disappointed. That was the standard it. that they measured it by. Yeah. Yeah. Pui and double pui. It did find success on home video and later cable. <laughs> but I found it still has this unfair reputation of being a really bad movie, by people who I'm convinced haven't even seen it. I heard that. Don't think I didn't hear that. <laughs> he owes me an apology. Oh. While it's not perfect, Popeye is a celebration of filmmaking. It's a stunningly impressive movie that, if nothing else, will have you wishing that film productions today were half as inventive. It takes comic characters and grounds them in a way that makes them feel real, but also never takes away their cartoon essence. It's a great blend of styles and tones that I feel really works for the characters. Nice looking first, eh? The good far outweighs the bad here, and I hope Popeye only continues to grow in popscularity. Nobody home? Oh, yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh.